Sebas tiene un móvil. Y sé que estaba en portugués, soy inglés. ¿Qué más de colonia? Se hablaba en portugués. Parece ser la primera opción, no, más. Eh, por respeto a los traductores que tengo un pay también en inglés, voy a utilizar el inglés como lengua franca, no, no como la lengua falada solamente en Estados Unidos o, o Reino Unido, más como lengua falada también en África del Sur, falada también en la India. ¿no? Entonces, con ese fuerte acento mexicano en inglés, puede ser más de colonial. Uh, solamente quiero hablar de por qué eh, escribí un paper sobre sobre todo las casas de Tucente Louverture, que son dos personas muy revisitadas en la historia, no sobre todo las casas, ¿no? aquí tienen grandes colegas, Manuel y Oscar, que han hablado de, de, también de las casas, ¿no? y que hablan mejor que yo sobre este tema, pero el problema es que sí se precisa una releitura, y también una releitura desde América Central, ¿no? una relectura del concepto de América Central, y una relectura también de la relación entre América Central y el Caribe. ¿Por qué? Sobre todo en Brasil, esta cuestión es importante, porque siempre todas las personas que conocen Brasil, que quieren mucho y todo, siempre hablan que eh, México es parte como una subcolonia de Estados Unidos. ¿no? La verdad, no se tiene que juzgar una nación o un pueblo por las decisiones de los estúpidos gobernantes de derechos, ¿no? Porque si no, todos en América Latina tenemos en Turibe, Vargas, tienen muchas posibilidades, perdón por Vargas, porque es un gaucho muy reverenciado, pero eh, también es un dictador militar en muchas cuestiones, es un desarrollista. Entonces, eh, por eso es que yo quiero hacer esa relación entre el pensamiento negado, ocultado, como fala Lúcia, de, de uh, América Central, y ubicar también geopolíticamente a México también en América Central, no como esa parte del bloque de NAFTA, del norte de Sudamérica, sino también como parte de América Central. Y recuperar el pensamiento crítico de la historia de las casas de, de su centro de obertura, pero también el pensamiento que está oculto, en los pensadores neomarxistas, eh, por ejemplo, trinitarios, ¿no? James eh, Williams, en eh, Martinica, eh, Fanon, eh, Anesesá, también en América, las experiencias revolucionarias sandinistas, experiencia revolucionaria cubana, la experiencia también de luchas de los pueblos indígenas y también de luchas revolucionarias en Salvador, en Guatemala, en muchos lugares, ¿no? en Guatemala, en Guatemala. Entonces, reestructurar esa historia un poco oculta. ¿no? Mas, now we're talking English. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do with my paper regarding uh, the, the thought of Las Casas is to re-inscribe and to reinterpret Las Casas in many senses. Las Casas is a very controversial figure. First of all, he is known as the most as giving the theological description or the theological apparatus in order to destroy la encomienda, which is mostly the form in which slavery took place in all of Latin America or in Spanish Latin America, which is uh, it's constructed around the idea of the soul of the Indians and the idea of conversion of the Indians into Catholicism. So, even if Las Casas is the destroyer of La Encomienda, he was an encomendado too. This is the first contradiction. He had Indians in his encomienda also. And he then uh, passed through a process, a reconversion, let's say, in which he renounced his encomendados. But Las Casas kept one slave. You know? And this is very important in order to reinscribe and reread. Las Casas fought in a Latin American, in Central American, and Caribbean perspective. Why? Because Las Casas fought that in order to uh, help the suffering of Indians by the Spaniards, that slavery should go on in the new in the Indies. No? So this is a, a fought that's very provoking. I mean, this is the first time which theologically, which philosophically, the status of non-whites, of non-Spaniards, are divided into two classes, no? 
and this will be a very colonial cut in the histories of Latin America, in which the Afro-Latin American movements and the indigenous movements would be separated. If we bring this argument uh, to today, now we have a bit of good news in this sense. Why? Because we have the Garifuna community in Honduras, which has reivindicated both its Afro-Latin American background and its indigenous background. But still, I mean, the Garifuna the community is very small in the sense of the solidarity taking uh, a previous concept with the development of Paul no? in Latin America. Also, juridically, we see a movement towards the expansion, and I connect this uh, with Roger's uh, discussion, of the uh, 169 Convention of the International Labor Organization to extend it to other subjects of coloniality. First, it's thought of as a convention for indigenous people, but it's been reintroduced by the Colombian Constitutional Court in order to protect Afro-Colombian people and Afro-Colombian dispossession of land in Colombia, and also in Brazil by the Tribunal Supremo, or the Superior, uh, with a horrible vote by Minister Peluso no? regarding Quilombola uh, communities in Brazil. And now the Arifunas are also talking about their inclusion in the 169 Convention. No? So even though I agree with Roger, even though we have this limitation, we also have these possibilities of reinterpreting, rereading, and the possibilities which are very limited, very small in legal terms, but law is very that's a very small contribution for political change. So, in a sense, it's logical that the contribution was small. But going back to Las Casas, this is a very important debate in Las Casas' thought. And it's very uh, representative of his own contradictions, of his own contradictions regarding the encomienda, of his own contradictions regarding indigenous people, and also of his theological apparatus. The thing that Las Casas introduced was one of the most efficient colonial apparatus of his day, which is the emptiness of the soul of the Indians and the emptiness of the continent and of the land, which means that there are people who are ready for conversion, and which means that their culture will be empty and filled up with Occidental uh, Catholicism and with Occidental geographies of uh, economic production. No? This is, Victoria also uh, had a lot to do with this apparatus, no? with this theological apparatus. But the thing is that if we see the faces of modern capitalism regarding indigenous people, this is a basic and constant element of all contemporary capitalism regarding indigenous people. One, the emptiness. Two, remember Sarmiento's, uh, Argentina President Sarmiento's uh, phrase of the battle in the desert, which was the pacification or the genocide of indigenous people in the north. Why was it in a desert? That's not a desert. What's the concept of the desert? Emptiness, as the soul of the Indians. Emptiness, which means a radical epistemological violence in which you are deprived of any sense of subjectivity, of any sense of geography, of any sense of economic production. No. So this is my re-lecture of Las Casas. It's a bit uh, very hard to, to establish because if you, if you see Las Casas for geographically and his, uh, in, in a sense, his, his, uh, his use, the use of the name Las Casas in Mesoamerica, in Guatemala, in Chiapas, it's very important. The capital city, not the capital city of Chiapas, but the historical capital of Chiapas is San Cristóbal de las Casas. This is where, in 1994, the SZLN, the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional, took over, which was symbolic of the uh, Catholic, uh, let's say, motherland of Chiapas, no? And also the, the biggest town near Los Altos de Chiapas, which until today are one of the most exceptional experiments in indigenous autonomy in the world, in which you have four autonomous regions with a university, with the Escuela Zapatista, it constantly, constantly evolving. You know? 
and also intercultural because you have Tohono Valles, you have Sosiles, etc. So you don't have just one uh, ethnic base. You have a three and four base, no, with mestizos in this uh, communities. No? So Las Casas is very important symbolically, not only because of the city. Also, one of the most important NGOs working in Chiapas is called Fraga Nome de Las Casas, which is an inheritance of this Catholicism, uh, Catholic way of looking at uh, the other, no? a healthy deal, but also integrating into Catholicism. No? But still, I mean, this is a very important NGO who's done very important work for indigenous rights and everything. So, I mean, the, the name Las Casas is symbolically very important. But I think that to base all human rights on the concept of emptiness, on the concept of assimilation, of radical assimilation, on the concept of one supposedly universal but Eurocentric concept of human rights, is what is wrong with this discourse in Latin America. In a sense, this is the apparatus that Las Casas enabled, and it's still working till today. No? There's a lot of other concepts regarding Las Casas fought, but in a sense, um, why would I link Las Casas to, to Saint Louverture, which is a completely different scenario, completely different era? Because what Las Casas did to theology, in a sense, was the operation that Toussaint de Louverture did to liberalism. He destroyed the concept of liberalism as a European-centered issue. But the problem is that the, the apparatus is different. In a sense, what Las Casas was talking about in his era was something that destroyed the theological basis in which, uh, for example, Sepulveda, in a much more Aristotelian uh, interpretation of uh, uh, Thomist uh, philosophy would probably be right in, a, in that sense. I mean, it was horrible the things that he defended, but he, in a strictly Aristotelian way, he, he was right. No? So Las Casas breaks with this idea, and also to say that Louverture, in his practice, breaks with liberalism. I mean, it's the first time that liberalism has to deal with if everyone is equal, then why should there be slavery? And Napoleon himself was the one who made the order to keep slavery in Haiti. Why is this? And why would a liberal destroy the possibility of other persons to have the same rights as people in France? Basically because liberalism was a doctrine which was not thought of universally. It was Eurocentric and thought for Europeans. And what to say the Louverture brings to a uh, to discussion is, is liberalism really universal? Of course we know it's not universal, but his radical universalism may be a way of thinking or of negotiating in a modern area with the concept of universal liberal rights. Not of reinstating, not of restructuring, because it's a way of perpetrating capitalism, but a way of negotiating in these ways which Roger is talking about that were used even in growing the colony in the Americas. I have another example of that, which is maybe we shouldn't concentrate so much in the cronistas, no? in Las Casas, in uh, uh, Sagún, in all of the cronistas. Maybe we should read, for example, the compilation that was done by Miguel de Portilla of the Visión de los Vencidos, the indigenous accounts of the conquest. Why should we read that and why should we go, what should we do history of law? What purpose politically does it have? Well, I found in, in Vision de los, uh, de los Vencidos a letter which was written in the same sense that Roger was talking about. A person who was asking the king to uh, intervene because the local priest is trying to make his wife to sleep with him. No? Not very uncommon in those days, or who knows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing is that his appeal to, to the king is reinstating the colonial order, but it's using the colonial system in order to benefit from those <coughs> laws. No? So it's very interesting that I think it's sort of a decolonial twist on the own laws of the monarchy. No? As the Leyes of India were also 
they use in this way. No? So back to this um, back to this uh, idea of the same thing over for universal liberalism. <laughs> That's a fool, but I guess. <laughs> or a priest. No, <laughs> so the thing is that <laughs> the, the problem is that with, with Sete Louverture, this radical universalism must not be misinterpreted as a basis of prolonging liberal capitalism, but as a way of questioning that essence. No? And another thing that uh, C.L.R. James talks about in his very famous book, The Black Jacobins, he has a, uh, he wrote in the 1960s, 1960, a postscript to The Black Jacobins, which is very interesting, which is from Tucente Lobertur to Fidel Castro. And it's very interesting because he talks about this thing. He says, what is, what are the similarities between the Haitian Revolution of Independence and Castro? First, they're both West Indian. And you say, well, that's logical. They're both in the West Indies. Yes, but they're West Indian because they're a revolution against the plantation system. And this is very interesting because if you see one of the failures of the Cuban Revolution, it was the reinstatement of sugar as the national industry. And it's the reinstatement of the collective uh, idea of the plantation. And this was one of the great uh, uh, it was one of the great economic uh, problems of Cuba. Why? Because you were selling sugar in an international dominated market by capitalists. So your insertion in a communist economy is in a capitalist economy. This is the same thing that happened to the Soviet Union. And this is one thing that we must think of when we have the new left in Latin America. It's oil, it's gas, it's mining of the new left-wing governments in Latin America done in a capitalist market which reinstates, again, the domination in the colonial domination. No? This is what I think would be the, the political um, issue which we must uh, focus on. So maybe let's rethink why to say the Libertador was so dangerous, because even the Libertador of the Americas, Bolivar said, let's not have another hate. These are famous words of the Libertador. No? That is, criollismo and the new constitution, constitutionalism, liberal constitutionalism, likewise, in my country, in India, and Sato Pekini himself, is the negation of, to say the Libertador, is the negation of the other coming into power. And it's the, re the installation of liberal criollism with a uh, certain subjectivity, which until now, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, you know, and Venezuela's own left-wing revolutions were instated by this colonial moment of constitutionalism, of liberal constitutionalism, tainted with some uh, left reforms. But still, the moment of constitutionalism is a moment of liberalism. So we must think, in the words of Bolivia, do we, have, do we want another Haiti? I think we want another Haiti. Thank you.